All right. So today's guest on Kowalski Analysis is Lilo Brancato. Thanks for coming on, Lilo. Thank you, Rob. Appreciate you having me on the show. Thank you. Absolutely. So before I actually introduce you, Lilo, and tell everybody, uh, you know, who you are, I just want to give a shout out to this episode sponsor, Micah Hughes with Mundal Consulting Network. I've known Micah for several years, and uh, he's been a big supporter of me and, and of City Fam for a while now. And what he does is he creates pathways to financial peace through home ownership and real estate investing. Uh, what I love about Micah is not even so much what he does, but why he does it. I tell you a story. Micah came into my office a couple of years ago, right after I started City Fam, and he started to explain his business to me. And while we were sitting there, he literally started to cry. Like he broke down and started to cry. The guy's all heart. He really cares about people and he wants to help people gain financial freedom. You know, at City Fam, we're all about becoming the best version of yourself. And uh, the way to do that uh, sometimes is, you know, by gaining financial freedom. You, you can't be the best version of yourself if your finances aren't in order. And Micah does that for people. So, if you're out there and you, maybe you want to own a home or maybe you're interested in real estate investing, maybe you're a first time buyer, or maybe you want to sell your house quickly, call Micah Hughes. He'll take good care of you. Mention that City Fam sent you. You can reach him by calling 410-999-0495 or Micah Hughes at mundalconsulting.com. All right. Now, good to catch up with you, Lilo. So, um, yeah, I just want to dive into your story a little bit first before we, we, I start firing questions at you because um, I think some of our listeners might not know it. So for anyone out there that doesn't know Lilo, you, maybe you've seen the movie A Bronx Tale. It was 1993. Is that the year it came out? Yeah, that's when it was released. But uh, we, we made the actual film in 92. Okay. Yeah. So, so a lo long time ago. Lilo was the star. He played Robert De Niro's son. And uh, that was a huge movie. I was actually just watching some clips from it the other the other day. And uh, if you don't know Lilo's story, he was a, a rising star and in, in, as a child actor in Hollywood. And you tell me if I get any of this wrong, but basically you, you started using alcohol and was, was it cocaine? Was that your first drug of choice or? Well, marijuana, but I mean, I don't think that was really the gateway. I think it was more the alcohol. Yeah except you know being able to go out at such a young age and <clears throat> just the accessibility to to alcohol then led to like yeah cocaine yeah um, first hard drug right. um and uh you know i didn't really have any i didn't really have anyone within my family like my parents were immigrants and you know grew up around italian italian people who really didn't have like experience in that sort of thing Sure. So I was like, you know, I was blind and I was just using and I kept using and just thought, you know, that one day it would just go away. Sure. I would just outgrow it and I would move, you know, move on with my life. But that wasn't the case. Yeah. And it just, you know, it, it got, got much worse. Right. So the story goes is basically that the addiction kind of got worse and then you got caught up with uh, an ex-girlfriend's father. It was kind of like a somebody that you were hanging out with, probably just partying with. And then you guys went to go cop some drugs. and Well, it was, it was more than that. I wasn't hanging out with him, really. The reason I was hanging out with him was because his daughter had broken up with me yeah. because of my drug addiction. Sure. <clears throat> so when I would go by the house, you know, trying to talk to her and trying to make things better, she would like, you know, call the cops and that sort, you know, that kind of thing. So I said, you know, what? maybe if I became friends with her father, this could be a little easier because then I would have a reason to go by the house without her saying, you know, you better leave. I would say, I'm just here with your father, you know, but it was really just to see her. And a lot of people didn't know that part of the story. And I think that, you know, when I tell my side of the story, it makes much more sense. Because the way the press, you know, handled this was like, as if we were like buddies for like 30 years right. and we were like bank robbers. And one night we just went out and killed a cop, but that's the picture that they painted. And yeah. that's not what, you know what I mean? I was, <clears throat> I was almost 30 years old at that, on that night. Yeah. And at that point in my life, I had never even been arrested on a felony. You know what I mean? Maybe some misdemeanors, but just things associated to addiction you know, a uh, possession under the influence, things like that. Sure. So it doesn't, you know, you don't, you don't go from 29 years of doing that than to saying one night, come on, Steve, let's go out and kill a cop. Right. That That's, it doesn't work like that. You know, like they, they, there would have been some kind of, you would have seen a pattern of violence right. early on. Sure. Like maybe beats up a kid in school 
And then at college, he stabs a kid. Now, when this happens, you're like, you know what? It's not a surprise. We saw this coming. Right. This was who he was. Right. But like with me, I didn't have that character. I, that's not what I was. I was always a funny guy. And then, you know, for all these years, they wrote, you know, like it was the worst guy in the world. And it really hurt me. You know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. It really hurt me. And it's, it is what it is, though, you know? So. Yes. So for anyone out there that's watching and doesn't know the story, so basically you guys went to go cop some drugs you were you were dope sick probably and you you know broke a window maybe you're trying to i think you said you were trying to get the guy's attention and maybe that you threw a rock or something the window broke no i broke it with i broke it with my boot oh okay <laughs> yeah because there were microscopic glass shards in my boot hmm. consistent with that with that window sure and i never shied away from that right you know i never said i didn't break the window i did yeah. break the window but there's a difference between someone desperate for drugs and trying to get someone's attention right. as opposed to someone who's burglarizing a home or right. a residence. A burglary is a two-part crime. It's like, you know, it's to knowingly enter and remain unlawfully with the intent to commit a crime therein. Right. So you got to prove both elements of the crime, you know? And my own friend, rest in peace, his name was Charles Magner. He testified in my case, in my behalf, saying that, I used to climb through his window in the middle of the night. And I did. <clears throat> and he lived with his aunt. Mm -hmm. And the you know, DA was like, he used to climb. Yeah, but he would never wasn't there to hurt us. Right. He wasn't there to rob us. Charlie had back surgery. So he got oxy. They give him a million. So if he wasn't answering his phone, I'm going through his window. I'm gonna, right. He's going to see me that night. Yeah. One way or another, I don't care if I got to put a, a, a ladder on my father's <laughs> van and tie it up and go to his house and climb through the window. Yeah. I'll do that. Yeah. But I'm not going to hurt him and I'm not going to hurt his aunt. I right. just want the oxy and I want to yeah. go home and be able to go to sleep. Is that too much to ask? Right. But as an addict, that's the way we think, right? Is that too much to ask? Just right. So, but that's what it was, you know, yeah. but they made it out to be like an arch criminal out guns blazing. And you know, that's what, but it's not even close to that. Right. You know? So yeah. So long story longer, basically what happens is you guys are leaving the scene and then a cop comes out pulls his gun on you, tells you to freeze. He ends up shooting you and then gets he shot. He said, I was walking away. And you know what's crazy? That house that he came out of, I knew that house. The little kid who played me in the Bronx Tale as a kid, mm -hmm. that's where he lived. Wow. His, his sister was my first love. We used to do the laundry in the basement apartment where the cop lived. Can Did you he imagine you? that? Can you imagine me as a kid with my first love at 16, washing clothes, thinking in, you know, 15 more years, there's going to be a cop that's going to live here, that I'm going to go next door and this is going to happen? Can you imagine like the way life works itself out and the things that happen? I, I think about that and I get chills yeah. to know from that apartment, you know, but that's who lived there. So I knew the guy who they said I was burglarizing his house. I used to fight with my ex-girlfriend and go through the garage in the middle of the night and fall asleep. He wouldn't even know I was there until he went to use the bathroom. And here's the main thing. He was a Vietnam veteran. So he had tons of pills in his house. He had Tylenol, codeine. He had Valium. And he would give it to me. He was like Rain Man. He was like a little loopy. Mm -hmm. And he'd see me on the couch. He would know I got into a fight with my ex-girlfriend, right? So you know what he would say? What's the matter? Trouble in paradise? <laughs> and I'd say, yeah. And he'd call me. He wants to, he'd give me like two or three Valium. This started at a young age mm -hmm. and these people are like, think it's so hard to like, I'm trying, I'm painting this picture. That's real. My sister-in-law testified. They had a picture with the guy, Kenny, who lived in the house and her friend Roseanne in Nathan's in the photo booth. So that should tell you what this kind of guy this was yeah. hanging out with kids, driving yeah. them around. So of course I had license or privilege to go through the window. Right. I never got in, but even if I did, the guy knew me, I used to do that. Yeah. You know, so, so, so the guy you're with, you know, the, your, your girlfriend's, uh, your ex-girlfriend's father, he's carrying a piece. You don't know it. He ends up getting into a gun battle with the cop. The cop ends up losing his life. Well, the cop shot me first. I was walking away. Yeah. He, no, he was coming out of the basement apartment. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. He came out from the basement apartment. I'm in between the two driveways because both houses were identical like identical blueprint. They were probably the same builder. They were the same exact house, just, you know. So there was this thing in the middle, it was level. But then you had the two driveways that went down. Then the walkway would lead to the little alleyway 
where the window is on one side that was broken. Mm-hmm. And then the window that he lived in that he heard from his bedroom on the other side. So that's where the windows were. When I was walking away, he came out of the basement apartment. It's, it's, it's like 5.30 in the morning, you know? And at that time in the morning, I didn't expect to hear or see anyone. You know what I mean? So as I'm walking away, he said, don't move. And I, I, I jumped. I mean, what would you do if somebody said, don't move? 5.30, you don't know this. You don't know who this, who is this? Right, sure. Right? Don't move. And I was smoking crack. So I'm already paranoid from that, snorting dope. So when he said that, I turned around, like what, you know what I mean? And as soon as I did that, boom, boom, started getting shot. I got shot one, two, and then a graze, you know, unarmed. I didn't have a gun. So you shot me. I'm walking away. You said, don't move, but you didn't say don't move police because your landlord, his name was Henry Zizek, like a middle uh, Eastern European name. It was the, it was DZ. I E whatever X whatever it was, you know, that was his name. He testified and said, he heard someone say, don't move. Did you hear them say, don't move police? No, did not. He didn't. They, we established that. So right. he never identified himself. I'm not saying that it's right that a cop got killed because he didn't identify himself. That's not why I'm trying to go with that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I'm just trying to explain what happened there that night, because I think, some of these things that I say definitely mitigate the whole situation and people's perception of that situation. Right. Oh, geez, I didn't know that happened. Oh, he got shot too. He didn't have a gun. You know what I mean? Then it's like, that's not the stuff that they put at the top of, you know what I mean? That's yeah. the stuff you never hear about. Yeah, of course. But that's, you know, that's what they do, you know? Of that, course. The best part about this, I'm going to tell you, this is, this is why the media is a bunch of bullshit. All right? You wanna, I'm going to give you a perfect example why the media is a bunch of bullshit, okay? This was back in the summer of like 07 or whatever it was. I was in Rikers Island. I was held there for three years awaiting trial, okay? Summer, go to court. I got my suit on, right? My whole family's rallying behind me, all my family, my friends. The whole courtroom is packed every single time, right? But there, the other side is also, though, with the cops and everything and the family. So. That was always there. That presence was always there. Court, okay. We got a couple of the uh, counts, like the intentional murder was dropped. A couple of other things were dropped, okay? This is very important. This is stuff that should be written, right? For people who are following the case, this is what, this is what we want to hear. We want an update. What happened? Oh, wow, statements were suppressed? Okay, cool. That's great. Uh, this count was dropped and this count was dropped. Because when that kind of stuff happens, the case becomes significantly weaker. Right. So maybe that's not what they wanted people to hear. Not one word about anything of I just said, which is really what's important here. You know what they wrote? Jail, Lila Broncado is jail's sunny boy. S-U-N-N-Y, because I had a tan. You can Google that. It was in the New York Post. Broncado is jail's sunny boy. That's what they wrote. I had a perfect suit on and they said it was ill-fitting and I had a tan. That's what they wrote about. If you're following the case, like what do I care about if he has a tan or not? Right. What happened? Didn't he have a court date? Like what, what's, what's going on? You know? Yeah. But that's there's what they a lot, do. There's a lot of fake news out there. Oh, come on. Sonny boy. Come on. Right. So, it's insane. People so yeah, us. I love, I love the story. I was, uh, I actually didn't know it. I didn't know how you got cast, but you were what? Like 16 when you did a Bronx tale? I'm yeah, they found me on the beach July 5th, 1992. I was 15, going to be 16, August 30th. So like a month and a half or whatever it was. And uh, it was about a month, like, because when I went down, they, the guy was handing out flyers. I went to the Bronx, to the actual neighborhood where the film took place. It was called the Belmont Playhouse. So I went there. A guy's name was Marco Greco. And it's crazy. I just saw him in January. I haven't seen him since that day. Wow. And I just saw him at this place in the Bronx called Curvin's. Uh, so. He was an agent, a casting agent or what? He was a scout, a scout. like a, a talent scout. And as I kept getting called back, there was less people there. They would come in one after the other. Oh, I'm going to do a screen test. So I want you to dress like you're going to church. I'm going to put you on film. He said, we're going to see how you look on film. 
So I remember I'm sitting in the room, I'm there with my dad. And at this point, because I haven't seen anybody come to read for the part. So I'm thinking I pretty much got this in the bag, you know? So yeah. I'm sitting there with my dad. And next thing you know, somebody comes on this side and he taps my shoulder. And he was like, hey, what's up, man? He goes, I'm Phil Garbarino. He goes, I'm reading for Cologero too. He goes, it's me against you. I was like, oh boy, I didn't know that, right? So do you know who that was? It was the kid who shot Sonny at the end of the movie. Yeah, I heard um, that. He was like a little older than me. So it would have been a different movie, 21 versus 16. Yeah. That's a big difference. And I, I personally think the movie works better with the kid young. Sure. I think at 21, it's not, you lose a lot of that. Because it's like at 21, you kind of already made, made up your mind, kind of. You went yeah. in the direction you wanted to go. Yeah. 16, you, you didn't, you're like right here. Before it's it either this or this, you know? Absolutely. So you're more like, impressionable then, so. Was acting an aspiration of yours before that, or did you just kind of? Just they found me on the beach. I was so you know so grateful, so humbled by. I mean, it was the opportunity of a lifetime. Wow. But I had never, I never even thought of it. Never even thought of it. School just ended. I worked at a law office. My father was a builder, so the the attorney that he used to use uh, for doing when he did closings <clears throat> is still a very good friend. He's like my mentor. His name is Corey Rabin, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and Corey's like, you know, like my older brother, I love him. You know what I mean? The guy to this day gives me the best advice. I worked at his law office because he knew my family when I grew up. His father's a judge. He's the attorney. And uh, I used to answer phones. I used to file. I used to get food. You know, I used to do everything. And believe it or not, that was 1992. I used to make $9.50 an hour off the books. And that was, that's not bad. Imagine that. When you're 16 years old, especially. $10 off the books in, mm -hmm. in 1992. You yeah. know, so. so what were you just a natural at acting or did, I mean, did you have to take some classes as you were making the movie or what? Oh, I pretty much uh, had a knack for it. Yeah. You know, the, when I went to the Belmont Playhouse later on that day after the beach, the guy just handed me some flyers and uh, not some flyers, some, some, some scenes. He, the scene he sent me was uh, when I'm shaving and said, Hey dad, you know, Joey also, uh, you know, Joey, but in the original script, De Niro was shaving. Mm. the father's shaving mm. and I approach him. Okay. Uh, but this, the way they changed some things around. So I think it worked better because I think that was right before I was going out with her. So it just made more sense. Like I'm shaving cause I'm going out now. You know what I mean? Sure. It just worked better, but that's the way it was initially. And that was the scene. Hey dad, let me ask you a question about something. You know, Joey mm. Bomber from down the block. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he asked me what I, I just knew what to do. Like I read it. And I memorized it and I says, oh, pretty simple, you know, pretty easy. I just did it. And the guy loved it. And then he started getting, oh, do you, would you mind reading this scene? I was like, yeah, let's do it. And then we did other scenes. And then <clears throat> I told him that I was of Sicilian descent. The character, Calogero, my name is Lillo. That's the same thing. It's Sicilian. These right. are very Sicilian names. Uh, and my father, the patron saint from the town that he's from in Agrigento, Sicily, is San Calo, San Calogero. And my father's, you know, I speak Sicilian. So I was telling him that as well. Like I speak that dialect really well. I'm very familiar with the Sicilian culture. So, you know, and he was like, wow, this is so perfect. You know, and he was like excited. And this is like, you know, the VHS camera. <laughs> and he's, you know, and he's, he's recording the auditions and what I was saying. I went to work the next day to, at the law office and uh, I got a call. Wow. And they said, hey, we'd like to meet you. And that's when I went down. And then, and then we did the screen test. It was, you know, they did all the other parts, all the other kids and this and that. And then everything at the end, it was just me versus Phil. Mm -hmm. We literally went shot for shot. We literally were like, boom. And then he punched me. Like, that's what it was the whole night. And he's right in the next room. I can hear him doing his thing because yeah. he's right there. And then it's like, I'm nervous because I'm like, oh, that was pretty good. Oh, that was pretty good, man. Damn, Phil. Now I got to go and I got to top him. But here's the thing. The scene when Sonny smacked C around. Remember when he smacked him around? When he yeah. said, where the F did you go with my car, right? Mm -hmm. Phil went first. Okay. He came out of the room. He had handprints on his face. He was, his hair was messed up. I'm telling you, this is the truth. His shirt was ripped. He had a button down shirt. The buttons were ripped. He was like disheveled. Yeah. And he came out, he was like almost in tears. And, and my father was there with me, rest in peace. And my father looked at me like, what are you doing? What, what, <laughs> beat you up now? What, what, you know what I mean? 
I don't know if I like that. You know, my father was looking at me like, what's going on here? These guys going to beat you up now too? You know? So, you know, I went in and I did it. And they never put a hand on me, not even a drop. They never put their hands on me. So I talked to Robert De Niro after that. And I asked him and I said, hey, Bob, I said, you remember that day when we did the scene with Sonny at the screen test, Phil and I? I said, I remember Phil, like I said, you guys really worked him over. I said, you guys really beat him up. I said, but then when I went in, I said, you guys never, uh, you never put a hand on me. I said, why is that? He said, we didn't have to hit you. You bought it. You right. gave us what we wanted. We didn't have to be. You did what we wanted. Exactly. So I was like, wow, you know, coming yeah. from De Niro. Right. So I was like, wow. It took me like a second to just like sink in. I'm like, it's almost like the little kid. Remember in the Bronx Tale when he looks and he realizes and he goes, yeah. And remember he has the hat on? It was kind of like I was like a little kid in that moment. Well, I was. I was only 16. Right. But being around De Niro, you feel even little of a kid because he's Robert De Niro, a yeah. living legend, my idol. So he's just told you like, ah, mm, I didn't think of it that way. You know, but that was the biggest compliment probably ever that yeah. I've ever gotten from someone was that right there. Yeah, I took some acting classes in college and some people just kind of had it or they didn't. You know, like some people were just really naturals. They, they weren't they weren't self-conscious. They weren't really, you know, they didn't care how they looked and they could just get into a part without being, you know, concerned with whatever. Vanity. Yeah. And things like that. Vanity gets in the way with a lot of people's performances. Yeah. Believe me that, you know, but I mean, I don't care. My hair's gone. I just, you know, I did this film. It grew in. I look like I'm 70, but I don't care. <laughs> you know, it's for a role with Jamie Lynn Sigler. Like, you know what I mean? And I got the mustache. It's in, it, 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 I play like an abusive dad, Sal, like my father, he did concrete and she's doing like the bills and he's telling her what to write. That was like my mom and dad. I was like, I lived this. I lived this. But like, I like started growing my hair. Like, cause the, you know, the director was like, grow it out. Let me just see. And I'm like, I'm trying, bro. There's really nothing growing. You know, like the sides and the back. But here it was like, I needed a little miracle grow. There was nothing really. So I'm like, good thing I can shave my head. I got a good, good round head. Cause yeah. this is over. You know, I may go out to Turkey, though. Did you ever see some – I know these kids that went – these Albanian kids that I know, they went to Turkey for transplants. It is the hair transplant mecca of the world. Really? I was – bro, my friend Paul Rassi, but he's Albanian. R-A-S-I, Rassi. He's got a picture of him after the Turkey or – he's in the pool as he just came out like this and his hair slicked back. Bro, there's nothing missing. Where's it coming it's, from? The hair? Is it? Is they taking it from the back and moving? Yeah, the... they're taking it from the back, but it's still fine. Really? They've perfected it. It's like on a different level. Trust me, bro. Back in the day, they used to make you look like a doll. Oh, you yeah. You were like sparse. You had like rows. Well, I have some friends that like... did that, and they look terrible. So they got the big scar in the back of their head. And then, you know, when it starts falling out, of course, you just got these big gaps in between it just looks terrible it's better no, to but that's ahead. that's back in the day bro if i show you a picture of this kid trust me when i tell you i would never even think of having going to a foreign country to have people poke at my head if i didn't think it was worth it so trust me i'm not gonna have no turkish people <laughs> poking at my head without seeing good results from many so you're you know? thinking about going i think i think I, my mind's made up <laughs> i just gotta get my passport because I, <laughs> awesome. you know why? Because it it it, it, it expires. I got to get. I got. I got to renew my passport. Yeah, that's like the last thing. I got my license. I got my life back in order. You know what I mean? Sure. It took a long time, but you know what? You know all those years, people slamming doors in my face and all that. But I always stood strong, and I knew that if I keep doing good, and I knew if I stayed sober, that you know what? You know, it took me a whole like pretty much a lifetime to destroy my life. You know what I mean? It didn't happen overnight. So I'm like, you know what? Now this is the this is on the other way. This is on the way down. Yeah. So now I got to expect the distance that it took me to get up here, the same that's going back down here. You know what I mean? It's 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 a lifelong struggle. It's an everyday thing. Yeah. And I think if you come to terms with that, I think it just gets easier. But obviously, you know, time goes on. You see the fruits of your sobriety. And then you don't really think of any way of living other than that way. You know? How long have you been sober now? I'm going to have 14 years in November, November wow. 18th. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I mean, if I run every day, dude. If you would be amazed, like I push myself, I run out there. Like I said, cause I have my little trail and cause I don't know if you know, like Yonkers, New York, 
mm-hmm. is one of the hilliest cities in the country. Mm-hmm. It's like top three. That's, that's a fact. Wow. So I got hills everywhere. So I do the nice little 36 minute, you know, like as Sebastian Maniscalco says, a little valet jog. I do the little valet jog up my hill all the way to the school. And I do 36 minutes of a, like a nice valet jog, burn all my carbs, all my sugars. Mm-hmm. Then this is 30 minutes of high intensity interval training. Okay. Mm-hmm. This is in the street. And if it's hot, I got the shirt off, but I'm getting tan while I'm doing this. Got the ear pods on. I'm geeked up on coffee and I'm, I'm working, bro. I don't care if it's 125 degrees, but I got hills and like I'll walk for five and then I always end up right where I want at the bottom of the hill. And on that, that sixth, that fifth minute, bro, I burst as hard as I can up that hill for a minute. And, you know, as it's getting hotter, it gets a little harder, but you know, you just condition yourself and you feel, and I, and at 43, I can honestly feel myself inclining and not declining because of the way I work out also, because I do a lot of, you know, as we get older, our testosterone, the, 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 the amount of testosterone that we produce gets lower and lower, right? But if you superset, I think you can spike your testosterone a little bit. It'll almost make you feel like you're on steroids, but yeah. you got to soup this kid, this guy, Benny Salmanisi. He was a professional bodybuilder. He was my attorney's, uh, my attorney's paralegal, that's his wife. And I used to speak to him sometimes, you know, he would be her for legal stuff. Then he'd be there and talk about bodybuilding. This guy taught me so many little tricks that work and his analogies, his analogies are the best. But he told me you need to superset. So I'm, I'm killing myself, bro. I sneak in a hotel down the street in the gym. There's COVID signs everywhere. Gym clothes, gym clothes. I go to the back to where there's the rent, car rental. They don't even see me. I'm working out. Nobody even knows. <laughs> There's no dumbbells, but I got 50 pound, I got 50 pound dumbbells in each hand. And I'm doing like I'm doing straight ball. Mm. Bam, my veins, my shoulders are out there just from holding the weights in yeah. place. And then I'll go right to that, bro. I'll drop right to the floor. There's no stopping. I'll come right close and I'll bang out 30, 30 close grip push-ups. Mm-hmm. I'll get right back up and I'll do it again. But you know what I'm saying? It t- it, I didn't wasn't just able to do that overnight. But now that I could do that, like, I feel like someone, like, elect- electrocuted me. Like, I feel like I'm, like, seriously, like, on, like, juice, like, when I do that. Yeah. It really yeah. makes me stronger, and I love it. And it's only three days a week that I got to work out with weights. Yeah, I think I what, do- people, what people don't know, too, is, like, when you work out like that, you get a lot of endorphins and chemicals that your brain releases that are similar to, like, drugs, and that actually helps you stay off of them. I crave that, man. I- I've had the flu, and I go to the gym. Yeah. I, I, I had COVID for three days and I didn't know if it was going to come on stronger, but it just kind of like went away because wow. I got the, the vaccine for pneumonia for the gunshot wounds. Mm-hmm. So I guess it saved me that vaccine, but I was scared though, because I lost smell, taste. My brother called me from downstairs and he was like, yo Lee, he said, I just got tested. He goes, I got COVID. He goes, stay away from me. Wow. Her fa- my sister-in-law's father died March 16th, right when everything just started. So we all gathered at my house later on that night to mourn. Her sister came over, all her aunts and everybody, right? <clears throat> Somebody in that crowd had the COVID. After that day, like a week later, it was like anywhere from six to eight people had it. Just wow. like that, bro. So it does spread that fast. I've seen it. Yeah. And we all had it. And we got three kids downstairs. My nieces are four and my nephew's eight. And both parents had the COVID. None of the kids got sick. Can you mm. imagine that? None of the kids got sick. So thank God for that. You know? Right. Yeah, it's wild. So much. Inf- I mean, I don't personally know anyone that's had it. You're probably the first person I've talked to that ha- has had it. I've talked to people th- that their family members or someone else has had it. But it's like, almost like I, you don't even know what to believe with all, all the misinformation out there. You see all the rioting going on. I'm like, well, hold on. How's that working? Like all these people around each other, all of a sudden. Well, COVID's to- real, you know, like, cause Westchester County, that first case in New Rochelle, yeah. that attorney, that's 10 minutes from my house. We were the epicenter, Westchester County. Like mm. this is where it was. Wow. And believe me, it spread like wildfire. I got news clip. My friend, Victor Amoretti, he had it. He was on a ventilator for 18 days. I got the news. My, my, my sister-in-law's grandmother, she's 100 years old, and she had it, and she survived it, and she's wow. good. Yeah. 
Yeah, one of the toughest ladies I ever met. She buried literally like four of her own kids. Mm. Four of her kids, and she peaked corona at 100 years old. That's wild. So Until like a few years ago, she was knocking drinks back at like family parties. You know, she yeah. was 95 years old. So, you know? Yeah, man, let's talk. I, so I, I, I used to be a partier. I, I've used just about every kind of drug. I didn't use heroin, thank God, because I, I would have been a tough one to get off of. But how? so tell me, like, what was life like for you after Roxtail? Were you still in school in Yonkers? Did you move to California? No, I, 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 I made the attempt to go back. But by that point, like, I've experienced the whole new lifestyle and going out every night and women and stuff like that, that it had too much of a pull. Yeah. It was too seductive. And I remember going back to school. I remember after Bronx Tale, because we finished the film, we started shooting August 31st, 1992, and we pulled January off. And then we came back in February for like a couple of weeks to do pickup stuff and little things. Uh, so then I went to school. I remember it was middle of February. I went like Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And then, then the weekend came. And then like Sunday night, I went to the limelight in New York City. And I remember I fell asleep. I came home at like four in the morning. I fell asleep on my couch downstairs. And I remember my father came um, upstairs. He's a working man. Yeah. So he came downstairs to wake us up for school. My right. brother's got his room downstairs. So my father's getting ready to go work. He puts on the espresso machine. He's, he's a construction guy. And he's knocking on my, my brother. Let's go. He's telling my brother, let's go. Get up. You got school. But my father spoke, you know, he spoke to like, you know, this guy whatever. That's where my father, let's go, we're gentle, let's go. So boom, boom. And then I'm like, listen, you know what? I don't think I'm going to make it this morning. I just got home about like about a half hour ago. So I think I'm going to sit this one out. So I didn't go and then I just never went back. And that was it. How old were you at this time? 17? I throw in a towel. Were you 16? I was like 16, 17. And I was like 17 years old. Limelight's 21. It's got to be 21 and above, but because of who you are, they just let you in? Yeah, when I was 15 with Chess. Chaz used to, you know, Chaz was a bouncer there. No. Chaz, that's how, that's how the whole thing started. The executive producer of the Bronx Tale is Peter Gation. He was the owner of the Limelight Club USA, Palladium, uh, and uh, Tunnel. Those were the four best clubs in New York City. That guy's claim to fame was he was a hockey player. He got hit in the eye, and he lost his eye, and he wears a patch. He sued. He made all this money. He was a club, a club mogul. He opened up a club because he's Canadian. He opened up a club in Canada called the Shark Club. Hmm. The dance floor was plexiglass, and underneath was sharks swimming around wow. on the dance floor. That was his first club, the Shark Club. And then he came to New York City. You had, I mean, his clubs were the best. You had the, the, the uh, Club USA. You had a slide that would go from upstairs to downstairs. The things in, that I've seen and done in those places at a young age, You'll never see anything like that again. Like New York City was way different back then. Yeah. It was way different. And I could only imagine, like imagine the 70s and 80s. Right. Like the Studio 54, my God. So but we could be out there in that time. I've probably been dead, you know? Yeah, no doubt. I, I, I often think that because I, I spent a, a little bit of time in LA, you know, and I was like, man, I, I'm glad I didn't go through my phase here because – I didn't have the self-control. I'm like, I would have died. I would have overdosed because it was so like, you know, people would party in, in Baltimore where I'm from, we would kind of sneak off in the bathroom and you'd have your bag, you do a little bump and then you come out, you you know, there you go to, to like Hollywood up in the Hills. There's like a pile of Coke on the coffee table and they're like, cool with it. You know, go ahead, help yourself. I'm like, I, I don't think I would have made it through that. So I, I can't imagine being 16 years old, having the fame, having some money, you know, and trying to match that. No, no, it was, and, and to go into all that with no experience, the lack of experience was the main thing that played a part in everything that happened. Sure. Because like, if say, if like I had like, uh, you know, a relative or someone that was in the film business, they could have came and said, hey, listen, you know what, man? I really think right now you should chill out because I don't know if you realize what's about to happen, but like your life is really going to change. So you maybe should just like chill out and be careful because now everyone's going to want a piece of you. You don't know who's who. You know what I mean? Yeah. No one told me that. It's just right. like, here, go enjoy yourself. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so you got sober. You got sober in jail, right? I did. But I was using in jail as well. Yeah. So that's, I, I was actually curious about that. So you go into jail and, you know, obviously people know your story. Are you, is that something where, you know, like, 
you go to jail if you're a, a pedophile, they're probably going to shank you in the shower. If you go to jail for what you go to, are, you, are, they, are they celebrating you? Is it easier? Is, it, is life harder? Let me tell you something. You want to hear, you want to hear what it was? Did you ever hear of Rikers Island? I've heard of it. Yeah, it's the roughest jail in the country. I want you to watch, uh, I want you to watch a, a documentary about the kid Khalif Browder. Jay-Z did the documentary on, uh, on Netflix okay. about the kid. He was 16 for stealing the backpack. And they show footage of him in Rikers. It's the worst. It's the worst place in the country because the CEOs are in on it. It's all corrupt. It's the most dangerous place in the country. There's no doubt in my mind. So now I go there for three years, but these were adolescents. The adolescents are nuts because mm -hmm. their brains are not fully developed. Right. But you know, and they just act out. But uh, yeah, I was sent there for three, three years. But what was your question? I, was it, how, I was, how was it for you there? Was it harder because of what you, you, they accused you of, or was it easier? When I first got there, because we had been shot, and my co-defendant was shot also, we were like in wheelchairs. Right. I got there December 19th, 2005, which was my worst day of my life, by the way. Had to be. I, someone just died. Okay? I got to live with that. Someone just died behind my drug addiction. I'm shot multiple times. I'm ripped wide open. Okay. I'm detoxing off 20 bags of heroin. Okay. And I'm facing the rest of my life behind bars all in one. No more hospital. Now we're in Rikers. So now they throw you in the cell and you're just looking and you just look at these jail bars and you're just in there and you, you don't know how, I don't know how God didn't give me the strength and I just break down because once I saw that, I realized like this may be the rest of my life. Wow. This, this, from this point on, this may be what it is. And that's, I remember thinking that all that happened during that time. So now we were in these cells, they were called the Bing cells, but this is like a medical dorm. So they can't put people in, in the box, in the hole because they need medical, they have medical, they need medical attention. So they got to keep them in these back cells. It's kind of punishment, mm -hmm. but I wasn't there to be punished. They were keeping me close custody because I was high profile and I just got there. There was a, another guy, he was punished in the middle, and then my co-defendant was in the first cell. And he's loud, and he did not want to be in that cell. And he's screaming, Shayao! Shayao! Can I curse? Yeah. Let me out of this fucking cell! I want my fucking rat! I'm supposed to get an hour rat! Open the fucking cell! Right, so going nuts. So I'm like afraid, dude. I'm facing the rest of my life. I'm 130 pounds. I'm junked out freaking strung out like you wouldn't believe my heart and soul are broken mm. like this little kid thinking like fuck man I fucked up and this guy's doing that that's what I'm doing that's what he's doing open this fucking show and I'm thinking to myself is this guy gonna get me in trouble right so now he goes like this because this is a medical dorm you got guys in wheelchairs guys paralyzed but bad guys, criminals. Mm -hmm. But they're in wheels. It doesn't mean nothing. Those wheelchairs, they got weapons in there. They got syringes. They shoot dope. You have no clue what Rikers Island is. It's the scariest place in the world, right? So now, CO puts a call into the administration. So now everybody shows up. They know where. We were all over the newspaper. We we're like the biggest case, like probably in the country, when that happened. Cop dead, actor. My, my, my manager was in Hawaii, and he heard about it. Wow. In Hawaii. It was big. Yeah. So now the, you know, the warden, everybody comes, right? And there was this guy, Depp Andrews. He goes, hey, Depp. He goes, what the fuck? He goes, we're supposed to get our wreck. Right, so the Depp goes, he goes, Armento, listen. He goes, we're doing this for your own safety. You know that. He goes, what do you mean my own safety? These fucking guys are in wheelchairs. He goes, what are they going to do? They're in wheelchairs. Right? So the guy, you know, they looked at each other. The, the warden was a female but she let the depth of security do the talking, you know? So they looked at each other and they went, he said, all right. He goes, we're going to give you a shot, right? Now we come out, we're in the wheelchairs, right? So now we got a dorm filled with like 50, 60 guys, beds, dangerous place. When everybody falls asleep, this guy got a beef with this guy. He's going to put some in the thing and he's going to smash his face while he's sleeping. Hi, hey, mom and dad, I can't make the visit. My face got smashed in. But if you want to come see me, I'll be at Elmer's Hospital right down the street every day, every single day. You guys getting walked out, blood everywhere. That's Rikers Island every single day. So they let us out, right? We come out. 
when everybody realized that it was us, because we just like were like locked up for killing a cop. These people in here, they hate cops more than anything in the world. Sure. More than anything in the world, they hate cops more than anything. Right. These officers. So they realize it's us. Now, this is to answer your question. How is the treatment? Yeah. Right? When they saw us and they realized, next thing you know, the whole place erupted in whistling and clapping. <laughs> going crazy. Gunshots, whistling, everything. Gunshots. So guys are coming up. They're going up to my co-defendant. They're asking him if he's a righty or a lefty. When he said they're kissing his trigger finger, saying, you know, F that cop. And, you know, that's the what. So I'm like, whoa. Oh, whoa, I'm like behind this guy. And then I'm like, this may be not so bad, you know? So next thing you know, we go in the shower. And I'm not sober yet at that point. You got guys, I remember this one kid. His name was Jay. We used to call him Leg. He literally had one leg missing. And he was from Trinidad. And his mother was the sweetest lady I used to see on the visit. Because her brother was locked up too. He got acquitted. But then the mother used to come see the brother. And she goes, don't worry, you're going to get your day. She said, you're going to get your day. She said, it was a very nice lady, but... This guy, right, he's got one leg. They got him on camera, and you see the guy hopping around. It's him, you know, but he still beat the case. He's got one leg with a mask on, and he beat the case. It was a felony murder like mine, and he's the first one that told me about that. Trying to kidnap a guy, throw him in the van, and then they killed him. He didn't do the actual killing, but because he was part of the felony, that's felony murder. Yeah, You see him on camera jumping up, dragging the kid in the car. How many people do you know that hang out in the same bunch that are missing a leg? <laughs> right or wrong? That's right. Funny. So, so, man, that's what I, I was just thinking. I was thinking about it. People giving know, us but, food, bro, was the best thing. I, I know you want to go some. Go ahead, no, man. it's all good. No, I was curious about that. I was thinking about, you know, I, I heard you talk about in another interview, you know, when the, when the cell door, the, that cell door slammed. And, you know, you kind of had that moment like, fuck, right? Like, and I think about, you know, it's amazing that humans go on. You know, like I see people, they, it's, there's something in us. Like you see homeless people, right? They, they, they're, they have the absolute worst situation, yet there's something in them that tells them to press on, you know, like and continue on. And, and you, you know, like you could have given up hope and just been like, man, whatever, you give up trying, but you're turning that adversity into something now. And I want to talk a little bit about that. You know, like I want to credit also to my, my support system. I yeah. didn't do it on my own. I had great people around me. My parents used to come see me, my brother, my close friends, my relatives. So I had a lot of good people on the outside that mm -hmm. made my time there a lot easier, which I'm very thankful for because that could make a difference. That, that is the difference yeah. of how you're going to turn out. Love understand that. when you don't have that direction you don't have that in life and it's unfortunate because i see some of these kids that are locked up they're good kids you know i'm with them in the same house for eight months and that poor kid did not get one visit yeah now one visit in eight months he's That's starving crazy. you know what i mean they yep. make their little eight bucks every two weeks on their books from the from the state because they got jobs you know they mop floors but what do you think you make it's like nine dollars every two weeks so i see some of these kids and i see what they go through you know what i mean especially like during the holidays and stuff like all, you know, you got me, a couple of my friends, we're all excited. We're going to see relatives on a holiday. You know what I mean? And some yeah. of these kids don't got anything. And I feel for them. I really do. Because that could easily be me. And I think about how fortunate I am that I do have what I have. And because of it, I was able to overcome. That was, the, this, they, were on, they were on the bottom of me pushing. I was pushing too. But they were right there. You know what I mean? Yep. The difference, that kid was pushing, but he didn't have anything else. So one little thing, he, he crumbles. Because he don't have the support. Yeah. You need the support. That's what a support system is. When you fall, they support you. He don't have that. Boom, yep. he falls. Yep. And it's like, shit, that's the difference. It's not like I'm better than him. I have more resources. I have more, you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's, that's just what it is, man. You know, yeah. it's unfortunate. You know, I'm just blessed. Though. Yeah. It's, so I, I run a nonprofit called City Fam, and we're, we're all about community, about doing life together. And I've seen a lot of people's lives change just through having, you know, healthy relationships, even just having somebody to let down. Let's say that where somebody has, they love you, they nudge you along, they tell you they believe in you and you just don't want to fuck up because you don't want to let them down. You know what I mean? And that can be all the difference. I, I think about the verse, you know, Jesus, where he, he talks about, he said, look, when I was, when I was uh, in the hospital, you didn't come to visit. And when I was in jail, you didn't come to visit. 
And they were like, well, when were you in the hospital? When were you in jail? He's like, well, whatever you did to the least of these, you did it to me. So when I, I became a Christian when I was 27 years old, and I, I've had several friends locked up since then. And I'm like, I got to go visit them because this is what I signed up for. And, you know, like, it's messed up when, uh, when, I, when somebody doesn't have that, when they don't have somebody to believe in them. Because that sometimes it's all it takes is that one little thing. And you don't believe in yourself. When you have somebody to reinforce your own belief in yourself that also believes in you, it's stronger. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like you get one stick, you crack it. Now you put two sticks. It's a little harder to break. Mm -hmm. And that belief, because now you have that support. And it's funny how you just said that with Jesus Christ. And I didn't know that, but I swear to God, I would always tell my father that. Imagine I was telling him, I give my father, because my father was sick. He was sick for so many years and he suffered since 07. He had a heart transplant. And then after that, the medication, anti-rejection, he caused diabetes and he just was a mess and poor guy suffered. You know, but I used to tell him, I said, you know what, Pop? I said, it's when you're in this place, in the hospital, or when you're in jail, it's when you see who your real friends are. Because guess what? You know what the common denominator is in both things? In both places, you have nothing to offer. 100%. That's what it's about. I have nothing to offer you. you ha it's all about what you can offer me right now because of my situation yep. and my vulnerable state right now. I'm sorry. Maybe one day I'll make it up to you if I can. But right now, this is what it is. So now let's see who comes. Because you know what? When it's the movie premieres and you, know, and you only got four tickets, 96 guys call you. Yo, could you get one for me, my girl? Yo, you want to me? me? And it's like, well, you did it when I was upstate. You didn't come see me. So now I'm not going to get you a ticket. You know what I mean? Hell yeah. And that's it. You're like 38th on the list, by the way, for not coming. You know, it's like, that's what happens. <laughs> Dude, I was, I was a, one of the biggest promoters in Baltimore for a while and I thought I had a lot of friends. And then the shit hit the fan in my life. Same thing. And I didn't have anything to offer anybody. And the people that I thought were really good friends. I, you know, like I thought these, some of these people were my best friends and I learned they were just people I parted with. They weren't because real friendship is built on sacrifice, you know? Real, yeah. Right. You know, like this is the difference between a real friend and a fake friend. Fake friends tell you I was going to come, but I just didn't have the time. I didn't have the time. Real friends don't have the time, but make the time. Yeah. Regardless of what it is, they find a way. Yeah. And that, that's just what it is. Is that a priority of yours? Is you coming to see me a priority of yours? Because when priorities exist in our lives, we make time for those priorities because this is just the way we are. This is human nature. So the fact that you didn't prioritize me in eight years means you really don't give a fuck about me, yeah. right? You don't really give a fuck about me. So now I don't really give a fuck about you either. But, but if I can help you, or if you came to me or someone you know, you know, Lilo, listen, this kid I know, he's you know, fucked up on pills and kid, no problem. I would never deny anything or something like that. But now it's like, you know what it is? It's a rude awakening, just like you said. It's heartbreaking, like, to see some of these people, like, I, I love this guy. Like, we used to hang out all the time. Now this guy doesn't even, you know what I mean? Nothing. Right. And, then it's like, and then it's like, when you see them many years later, it's like, for them, they don't skip a beat. Like, oh, you know, it's like, are you kidding me? Because when you're in there, all you have is time to dwell and think. You know what I mean? Yeah. Think about all those countless hours alone, stewing. You know? So, but then it's like, you know, that, and then you, you go nuts and you go nuts, you know? Yeah, man. So what, what's the future hold for Lila Brancato? Um, You know, I'd like to you know, continue to do service for others, you know, others struggling with addiction. But, uh, you know, I one day would like to, you know, have my own treatment center. Um, I believe that I can help a lot of people. I believe that because of Bronx Tale and what, of an, what an iconic film it was, and it just how it transcends time, I think that could be my competitive advantage mm -hmm. because there's so many life lessons in the film in which I've lived in my own life. So it's art imitating life and life imitating art. And the bottom line is the proof is in the pudding. You know, I'm sober. You know what I mean? And people see that. That's why I post pictures. It's not what you tell people. It's what you show them. You know what I mean? I was going to these, we, we, we had this event in, in, in Ohio. And, uh, you know, this company that I was there with, they were roasting one of the guys. And, uh, you know, you have these people that represent the company. They're up on the stage. And they're all like huge and out of shape. And I'm like, 
that's not what you want people to see because it's like, dude, if I'm about to recover and I want to recover and then I'm, you're telling me what to do. And I'm like, dude, you're going to die of a heart attack after one more sandwich. You know, like I don't want to look like you. So maybe I'm just going to stay getting fucked up. Right. You know what I mean? But so then they look at someone like myself, not to try to be conceited, but every day, days that I don't want to get up, I know I'm not only doing this for me. I'm right. doing it for other people that I can set an example for. That's the way it works. You lead by example. Love it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and man. That's I, just the way it goes, brother. You know? Absolutely, dude. I, I look at my 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 body as part of my testimony, part of my witness to Jesus, because if I'm going to tell people, Hey, you know, you got to follow this guy. He's going to make you become the best version of yourself. And I, I can't be fat because that just screams of the fact that I lack discipline, you know, well, it's, it's an extension of who you are. Yeah. I see somebody that looks a certain way, not always, but I would say about 90% of the time. Once I see a couple of things, I pretty much like pretty much everyone. I form an opinion about that person. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just based on what I see within the first five minutes. And usually I'm right, but not always. Cause you know, then sometimes, Whoa, I didn't see that coming, you know, cause you get yeah. a lot of that too. You know, just when you think everything's going great, you get punched in the face, you know, they're like, Oh, I didn't, I didn't think that guy was like that, but you know, and I look at that and it's like, well, you know, maybe that's, you know, it's a lack of discipline, right? You got to yeah. Listen, I like to eat too. Like I like a Big Mac every once in a while. I like this, but I know everything has to be done in moderation. Yep. <clears throat> you know, let me just give you one analogy from my friend, Benny Salmanisi. Remember I was telling you before the bodybuilder? Yeah. I'm gonna, this was a, a beautiful one, my friend. Wait till you hear this. He said, all right. He said, when you consume protein after the workout, he said, he goes, no fat. He says, you know when people put peanut butter in their shakes? He goes, you don't need, that's the last thing you need. He says, think of the, think of the horse as the carbs carrying the protein to the muscle, okay? He goes, basically the protein synthesis, it's yeah. carrying it to the muscle. Once you add fat into that equation, it slows the synthesis down. Hmm. You understand? You want your body to synthesize that protein because you got that 30 minute window. You start eating that peanut butter and stuff, cogs the wheel. Hmm. That's what the peanut butter does. You don't want that. And that's what Benny, that's from Betty Salmonisi. So, so what about that's like, a, a, what about a whole egg or something? Cause there's a lot of fat in eggs. Cause that's what I usually eat after my workout. Eat the yolks. Well, okay. You know what? I eat egg whites in the morning. Hmm. Like I got a whole big bag. I prep them like a day or two, you know, like in a view, like 40 of them and I'll eat them. Once in a while, I'll eat the yellow, but I get up. My first meal, I just eat egg whites because you know what it is? I want to eat because I want to get the, the motor running. I want to get the motor running. The metabolism has got to go. Metabolism is the, 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 the rate at which our bodies convert food into energy. That's what metabolism is. Metabolism is defined as. So I eat the egg whites at eight in the morning. Four egg whites, simple, like nothing, like you didn't eat anything, but it doesn't count. There's no calories. It's, it's only blank. 16, other than protein. Other than calories. protein, it's yeah. blank. Yeah. So it doesn't even count. 10 o'clock, you eat four more. Okay? So now you already got two meals in you. So your metabolism's already going. Mm. Okay? Your metabolism's already going. Then at 12 noon, sure comes off. I got the ear pods in. I'm ready. I'm at the bottom. I live down a hill like this, a cul-de-sac. So no warm-up. I already burst up that hill. I condition myself to go with no warm-up. Mm. Come up and I got this whole trail. Then I go to the school, <clears throat> but you understand there's nothing. I got, I'm, there's, there's nothing in me. Nothing no that counts. No glycogen or anything like that. Built right, up. So you're going to start burning stored fat within no time, but you got to be careful not to exceed your target heart rate. Cause then you'll start catabolizing. You'll burn muscle. <clears throat> Do you know the mathematical equation? The no. mathematical equation to figure out what your target heart rate is, is 220, which is, approximately the most times your heart's going to beat in a minute, right? You subtract your age from 220. 80% of that. 65%. Oh, 65. I didn't know that. 65% is your target heart rate. So for me at 43, it's like at like 116.5. So that's barely two beats a second. You know what I'm saying? But, 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 but when your heart's going, you know, you, 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 you're, you're exceeding your target heart rate. 
and you will burn muscle. So that's why you got to do those. That's why the valet jog, you really never go up too much. You understand? You stay at that valet jog, get your body in that fat burn mode. And then you do the intervals. You walk real slow for five minutes and then you hit it with that burst. It's like a car with the gas. When you're driving slow and you punch it, that's when you burn the most gas. You know what I mean? So, but yeah, so when you're doing the hit training, you're sprinting up those hills, your, your heart rate's definitely going above 116. So how, how's that work? But here's the thing, but it was just down. It was just down to nothing. Mm -hmm. You understand? So once you do it like that, whatever, whatever happens within the body, it will burn that fat because your body was just in fat burn mode. Okay. So because it happens that fast, it never switches gears to the, to the muscle. So it, it's right there already. So once you use that, because you require energy to do that, it strips the fat. It burns so much. And then after that minute, you come back down. You let that heart rate get all, all the way back down again. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then you hit it again. And let me tell you, you will see a difference that day. After you work out and you go home, you, take, you go to the bathroom, you take, you take a, a piss, you're going to see muscle definition in your abdomen that you probably didn't see. That's what happens. Wow. You crap it out. You pee it out. That's where the fat goes. It's gone. And you what do you think it. about intermittent fasting? Not I, think it's okay. I think it's okay to do it. Like, I don't think it's good to do it like forever. I think if you want to do it for like maybe a month or so, or maybe even less, and then go back to doing it traditionally. And then I don't think, I think it's okay. You know, yeah. for sure. Uh, like the yeah. Atkins diet, it was the same thing. Right. It's weird because I'm, I'm old school like you. I actually did bodybuilding like in my early twenties at a couple contests, just, just local in Maryland, I did the Maryland state. And, uh, you know, we were taught five, six meals a day. You try to eat, you know, every three hours. And that, and now you see these intermittent fasting people eating one or two meals a day and they're losing weight. And I'm like, this flies in the face of everything I was ever taught. I don't, I don't get it. Um, I think just because it's a shock to your body that your body may have some good results early on until it's like a pitcher. It's like when the pitcher first comes in the game, we don't know what he's throwing. So we don't, we haven't seen him yet. So maybe he'll get us the first two at bats. By, but by the third time we see him, we know what he's throwing mm. and he's throwing it less because he's tired now. So now we got, you know what I mean? It's the same thing. So now your body's like, all right, I know what's going to happen here. So it doesn't respond as well. So you go back to what you were doing and then go, you know, yeah, Mark Wahlberg, I saw him, uh, he had like a, a beef online with Dr. Oz because Dr. Oz was talking about how, he, you know, intermittent fasting and how great it works. <laughs> and Mark Wahlberg's old school like us. He's like five meals a day. So they were having this like little banter. It was pretty funny. And, and I don't know if you've seen Wahlberg lately, but he looks incredible. Does he? he yeah, I've been, I, I've been, I, I got to check, check his page out. I know, I mean, I know he's posts all those, you know, those, uh, what, inspired to be better, baby, right? Inspired to be better, baby, right? Well, yeah, he says it's fine to be better. I, I don't know if that's what he says, but he looks like he did when he was a teenager. I mean, he's that he's that lean. <clears throat> yeah, he looks good. He's always had he's always he's got great genetics, you know? Oh Yeah, for sure. I mean, like, listen, you know, you could take steroids, you could do whatever you want. If you don't have the good genetics, it doesn't matter. But when you have good genetics, in addition to good steroids, yeah, I'm not saying that, but you know what I mean? Like, it's like sky's the limit, but. I got to give him credit. I knew him when he was 22 when I first met him and he was like a physical specimen. Yeah. Cause I seen it in the flesh when we did Renaissance man. And I remember we hung out at the Balazs hotel. So I remember when I showed up, the guy had the shirt off. He was a beast. <laughs> he, like, you know, he was built like, you know what I mean? Like, wow. Yeah. I met him in Baltimore. He, when he was Marky Mark, he did a concert at a place called Hammerjacks. He got my buddy uh, Terry Mitchell up on stage because he reminded him of one of his friends, I guess. And he, he actually told us, he's like, come back to the Holiday Inn. I'm going to have some, I'm going to have a party. So we went back there and he came in and he, he ended up just grabbing a girl and going in his room and we didn't get to hang out with him. But I did have a. That sounds about right. I've seen him do that a million <laughs> times. Let me tell you something. <clears throat> I've never seen anybody get more girls than that guy. And I was with him. Like we hung out. We used yeah. to drive in the same car and go out. He was 22. I was 17. Like the first night I ever went out in Hollywood was with Mark Wahlberg. Was with Mark Wahlberg. We had, he had a Mitsubishi Diamante, a rental car. <clears throat> and I remember we went out <clears throat> and we had a great time. We went to the Roxbury and we went to bar one. This was like summer of 1993. This was like late July, August, 1993. And that's when I hung out with him. It was great. It was 
great man. Wilson's if I knew great. then what I know now, just in, just to real that I didn't really realize what was in front of me, what I had. You know what I mean? But or I would have treated it much differently. It would have been handled much differently by me. Yeah. You know. Oh but yeah. It is what it, you know. Yeah, man. I mean, when you start looking at, uh, I love the saying, it's like life happens for you. It's not happening to you. It's happening for you. So, so many people will be in your situation and they would feel like, you know, they might think, whatever, I, I blew it. You know, there's no coming back, whatever. But if you think about it, like some of the biggest things that I would have thought would disqualify me from doing certain things. Like, for example, like I'm a, I'm a Christian, so I talk a lot about, um, you know, my Christianity and following the Lord. I was, I was also a big man whore, you know, and, and, but God gave me this platform to now talk about waiting, which is crazy. And people listen to me because they know I lived on the other side. So if it wasn't for the, the fact that I was, you know, very promiscuous, I would never be able to have the platform that I have. I think in my mind, when I started is like, this has to disqualify me from doing this. And it's in what, in reality, it's the fact that what's makes it possible. So like when you start viewing it like that, like whatever, you know, whatever your circumstances uh, are yours, you know, yours in particular, it's a platform for you now to go out and do something amazing. And when you look at it like that, it's just all perspective, you know? That's exactly what it is. It's how you frame your mind to perceive the things in front of you. You could think like you have the worst, you could perceive it like you have the worst life in the world, or you could think about it and say, damn, I'm so blessed to have, you know, two legs and two arms, two eyes and two ears and everything works. And you know what I mean? And you just start looking at things like that. And then just things, once you're grateful for the most simple things, everything else falls into place. You know what I mean? It's like making a film. When you make a movie or a film thinking I want to make money, that's not how you make money. You think about, let's make a great film. Mm. Let's do everything we can to not sacrifice any authenticity from this, from the making of this film and for the production, you know what I mean? And, right. and, and all else will follow. That's what it is. Put your heart in the right place and all else will follow. And if it doesn't follow the way you want it, it's for a reason, but it'll bring you somewhere else that maybe later on in life you'll realize, aha, now I know why that happened. You know what I mean? Just as you were saying yeah. that <clears throat> it's because of your promiscuous past that enabled you to have what you have now. Right. It's because of that. You know what I mean? Which is, that's, you know, what do you think you'd be doing if you you didn't get cast in a Bronx Tale, if you never became an actor? You know, I was a really good student in school. Um, I really took pride in my education. I really took pride. I was, you know, I was in 10th grade. I was already thinking about college and where I was going to go and what I wanted to do. And, you know, like I saw my father work hard his whole life and bust his, you know, really break his back day after day. And I knew I didn't want to do that. Um, I knew I wasn't built like that. Like my dad, he was tough. And, you know, I always envisioned myself going to work every day with a suit and tie and being some kind of corporate guy. And I know that required an education. So I wanted to go to school. Um, and that's where I was. And then, uh, you know, because by, at that point, no, there was no drugs or, you know, I started smoking pot a while on the set of The Bronx Tale. So prior to that, I hadn't, I hadn't even seen any of that. I didn't even know what marijuana was. You could put it, you could put, you know, poison ivy in front of me and told me it was marijuana. And I was like, all right, you know what I mean? Right. So I was really naive to all that stuff. Um, but, uh, you know. What's, yeah. what's one piece of advice you'd give somebody coming back from, a, you know, a setback, maybe trying to battle an addiction, you know, get over it. What's, what's, what's the typical advice you give them? No matter, you know, this always worked for me because a lot of times when people use, it's not when they're feeling good. You know, I tell addicts, you know what, you want it, you want it, you want, you want something to help you stop using a real powerful tool <clears throat> service for other people. Mm. Go help some, go help someone, go do something good for someone else. Because what's going to happen is it's going to make you feel good about yourself. Right. Yes. And when you feel good about yourself, you do good. It's not like when we're feeling great that we go get fucked up. It's when we're feeling low and we want to escape this. And then it's like, we go, but just be good. Just go be good to another person. And that intrinsic value that's going to give to that it's going to give to you. It may be, you know, it may be give you, give you the, the power and the strength to fight for one more day. And then tomorrow you find another, you, you find your, you know, your next source of strength and inspiration to stay sober one day at a time. Just worry about right now, right now I can use this. So use it yeah. just for today, just for today, use it just for today. 
you know? Love, yeah, man. I love that. I, so with city fam, a big, a big part of what we do is we do social events followed by a service event, followed by a volunteer event. And the reason that we do it, and I talk a lot about it is when I started volunteering through my church, I started to like myself again. I did it's exactly what you said. I started to feel good about myself. And there's a lot of science behind that too. Just like working out when you volunteer, you get all these feel good chemicals that your brain releases. Neuro, neurotransmitters in your brain, they get released. Yeah. These are from the pleasure centers. Makes you feel good. When you feel good, you do good. That's when right. you don't feel good. So this is what I was going to say. My piece of advice is no matter how bad things get, they always get better. Or your ability to deal with it will get better. Because a lot of times addicts are like, oh my God, like what the hell's going on? And now they want to escape that because something just happened. And now they want to go get high to like mask the pain that they're feeling. Yep. But what I've learned, especially being in prison, because like you're locked in there. So shit happens. You get calls, you know, you call your lawyer. And he told me one day that they found a bloody glove on the windowsill with my blood. I'm like, that, I just, I, there's no way my glove would be there. I got shot up here. How's that my glove? So now I'm thinking they're planting evidence. So when I hung up the phone with him, that was like my life was shattered. Right. Because I had to beat the burglary to beat the felony murder. And I'm thinking, they're going to play dirty like this. I'm never going to win this case. A bloody glove on the window? So, like, I remember I was in the TV room. It was Memorial Day weekend of 2007. And I'm just sitting in there with these rowdy kids who's banging and fighting. It's crazy. I'm just trying to, like, say, just look at I'm thinking, like, my life's over. I had a little bit of fighting shot, but it's over now. You know, my phone replenishes, call my mother. She, and, and the first time she said, don't waste your phone time on me, Joe called. Joe Tacopina is one of the biggest lawyers in the country. He was A-Rod's lawyer. I mean, he's a huge lawyer. And I could cost me a quarter of a million dollars, but, you know, he got me off a murder charge, you know, on a, on a cop in New York City. So he's, so. My mother said, and Joe never calls. His paralegal will call. Benny's wife, Benny Salmonese's wife, she'll call. His partner, Chad, will call. Steven will call. Joe only calls when, you know, something's up. Joe's not calling me to ask me how I'm doing. How's the food? He's not asking me. He's not calling me for that. So my mother said, Joe called. So he said, Lilo, listen. He goes, you know, I got some more of the discovery today. He goes, Lilo, you know, like I told you from the beginning. I think you got a great case. You know, some really, really good, some really good facts. Some of the stuff I got was some really good stuff. Um, Lilo, there's one piece of evidence, you know, concerns me a little bit. Lilo, they found your bloody glove. It's your blood. They tested it on the windowsill. And I'm thinking, that's impossible. I got shot up by the driveway. You won't see any blood drops from that windowsill to where I was shot. How would I go back in the line of fire? I, I don't understand how this happens. He says, well, that's what you have me for. So now after that, because once you use up your phone at Rikers Island, you got a number one phone call. It's a... Uh, it's like a, a six minute and then you get a number two. It's a 15 minute call. Once that goes, right, you got to wait like a few hours for, to get back, to replenish. When I called my mother back, she said, Leela, Leela, call Joe. He just called back. He said, it's very important. All right. I called Joe. And meanwhile, before, in between the two phone calls, I thought my life was over, bro. Mm -hmm. I was in this TV room, in this TV room, not being able to go nowhere. Right. I got no phone time. I'm sitting here. I got to just let this go. I got to let this rock from now to then. You know what I mean? That makes you crazy. That makes you strong inside, mentally tough, just stewing on this, thinking of all different ideas and thinking of ways how I can, like real survival mode. Like, how am I going to get out of this now? Right. This is not the movies. You know, this is the real life. Like, this is, this could be the end for me. So now I'm sitting there and I'm thinking like, and you know, my friends are, you know, people going away from Memorial Day weekend, getting haircuts and, new tight shirts and hey, my skinny jeans. And I'm in here thinking like a bloody glove is going to put me away for like four decades. Mm -hmm. You know, this is mm -hmm. the difference between that. So when I call Joe back, when I, he says, Lilo, it was a mistake. It was the EMS people that worked on you. It was their glove. That's why they had your glove. Your blood was on it. Blah, blah, blah. They tested the skin cells. It wasn't your skin cells. So sorry. And I'm thinking, I know that's impossible, but see, no matter how bad something is, see, it got better. Right. And I saw that in real life. The stuff I post on Instagram, those quotes, 
It's because I went through every single one of them. I can relate at one time or another in my life, every single one of those quotes I have felt on one day on that calendar or other, you know? Yeah. So it's all, and this is what, you know, like I'm not afraid of anything anymore. And, you know, I used to be afraid to not be high and not, you know, that to have that comfort zone, you know, to know if things get rough, you just go pop, you know, 20 Norcos and itch your face off for two days and you'll be fine. But I don't have to do that anymore. You know, it's just like, and I'm so, no matter how bad things get, you're, you, they always get better or your ability to deal with it will get better. So yeah. don't make that impulsive decision Dude. and go get high because you may have some substantial amount of clean time, you know, under your belt. And now you're going to throw it away for nothing. Totally. I talk about feelings aren't facts because you're all good. You're all, you're always going to hit low. I spots. like that. Feelings aren't facts. They're not the facts because you'll hit, a, you'll hit a spot like that. Like you felt, you felt something, but it wasn't the fact. And you weathered the storm long enough to get past it. Cause I'll hit, I mean, you know, I, I quit using drugs, gosh, I don't know, nine years ago or so. And it was an emotional roller coaster. I mean, I quit having sex, dude. I mean, it was, I quit, I quit drinking for six and a half years. I, I went through a lot of depression, a lot of depression. It was like an emotional roller coaster. And I learned to just, you know, sometimes I'd go to sleep. I hit the reset button. I wake up, I feel different. I go, you know, I'm good again. But the, what I try to tell people is don't derail the train. Meaning like, don't do something in that moment. Go volunteer. Stay busy. Stay busy. Yeah. Because when you're busy, you don't have time to think about that stuff. Always keep yourself busy. Mario Lopez said something on TV one time. He said that me and my sister never had time to get in trouble because my mother kept us busy with so many things. There was no time in the day to get in trouble. And yep. I said, wow, that makes so, it's such a simple thing. Become yep. too busy to not have time to get in trouble. <laughs> and that's, it works, man. Yeah. Idle hands, man. Idle hands. Right. In this workshop. So I'm going to let you get off of here, but before you go, give me your uh, best of Nero impersonation. <laughs> Are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? I saw him on the set of The Irishman. He didn't know I was coming. The guy who did my hair on this uh, Woody Allen film called uh, Wonder Wheel with Justin Timberlake and Kate Winslet. Jerry Popolis was De Niro's hair guy. He did my hair piece. So he said, Lilo, because he knew where I lived because he came to fit me for the piece. And he said, Lilo, we're going to be shooting right near where you live. He said, you should come see Bob. He's got a light day. So I'm like, all right, I will. Meanwhile, I moved. I was living with my ex-girlfriend there. I moved back home. I'm on parole. I got no license. I stole my mother's car. While she was sleeping, I figured I'd take the hit for De Niro because Jerry's telling me to come. I got to come. I can't say no. This could change my life again, you know? But whatever, I just wanted to see him just to see him, just for him to see me now. So you don't go by all this fake bullshit that people say, me here now. Me, you know, like, what not, I'm not that I did that in front of him like an asshole, but just to see that I'm healthy, right? So they did the scene when he's throwing the gun in the, in the river, the Hudson River. He's walking back, the scene's over. He's walking back to his trailer. He's got his bodyguard and they're walking. I'm standing next to Jerry. I got the hat on. So he's got those platforms on because he was tall. Remember, Frank Sheeran was tall. Yeah. So he's tall. And he's got the green contacts. So he didn't look like, they, you know, like, I know it was him because I know where I am. I know he's the Irishman, you know? So he's walking by me. He gives me like a, and then he looked. He goes, hey. He goes, he goes I, I know you talked to my daughter. Are you okay? okay are you okay that's what he said are you okay like but not to try to make fun but he was genuinely sincerely concerned mm. you okay like really like are you okay man are you okay like i know what you went through and i know all the shit you went through but you know somebody's dead too you know but are you okay yeah are you okay are you okay how are you Okay. You okay? Huh? You okay? That's it. <laughs> well, I appreciate it, man. It was a pleasure talking to you, dude. I'm I'm proud of you. I can't wait to see what the future holds. I think, you know, you got a lot of people that'll be inspired by your story. Thank you, bro. And thank you for having me. It was great chatting with you. 
And, uh, you know, let's do this again sometime really soon. Yeah, absolutely, man. Hopefully one All day right, brother? sit down and uh, grab a coffee or something together. Maybe maybe work out one day if I make it yeah, up. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I would like that. Wow, that was a great episode. Really enjoyed talking to Lilo and hearing his story. I just want to give a shout out to this episode's sponsor, Micah Hughes with Mundal Solutions Network. Micah's a longtime friend, big supporter of mine and City Fam. If you're looking for someone that's like-minded, that really cares about people to help you maybe buy your first home or get into real estate investing, or maybe you just have a distressed property that you want to sell quickly, give Mike a call, send him an email. He does business in just about every state. He does uh, title lending. He's a licensed real estate agent, and he really helps people get to a place of financial peace 